Erica, how's it going? Thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Hi, Julian. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. So this is a, a pretty exciting one for me. Uh, I think the, the topic of cancel culture and libertarianism is super interesting. I feel like liber like libertarian, that's something that I, I think personally, like I never even like would have like said like, oh yeah, that's me. But then it's funny when you look at like the identification of how you classify that. And I feel like most people probably would fall underneath that, uh, like inside that box, whether they realize it or not. So I wanted to start off by you maybe just uh, giving your perspective of you know, what libertarianism is, what it means to you, or what it entails and all that. Yeah, for sure. So libertarianism is about understanding and maximizing personal freedom. And the goal is that when people feel free, then that maximizes human potential and flourishing. So I think a great place to start the conversation about libertarianism is on personal freedom, which can only come with personal responsibility. And um, a lot of discussion about libertarianism revolves around um, adulthood and the age of consent um, and the age of, of reasoning and moral reasoning. So that's a huge part of it too. Right, and how, how long have you uh, consider yourself a libertarian for? Well, I was introduced to libertarianism in 2011. So it's been, it's been a long time coming. I, I okay. was on board with the movement right away. Um, ever since the first election that I was able to vote in, I, I did vote libertarian uh, in 2012, the first time I was able to vote. And then um, I explored other political and spiritual ideologies and then found my way back to libertarianism. Wow, uh, I'm kind of interested now. What were, what were the other ideologies that you pursued? Yeah, for sure. I was really interested in studying and understanding a resource-based economy, um, which is people equate it with socialism and communism because it devalues ownership and places a lot of emphasis on the sharing economy. Wow. And uh, I, I could probably guess why, but uh, you want to maybe allude to what, like what's uh, strayed you away from that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as I got older and more mature for me personally, I, uh, I just resonated more uh, with theories relating to natural rights. Um, that is rights that a person has just by being, being a natural being, being a human. Um, and that I just feel um, is really important um, in an ideal type of society. So yeah, that's how I found my way back to libertarianism. I see. And like what, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on anarchism? Oh, I am definitely not an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think anarchy doesn't uh, promote or incentivize uh, exceptional behavior, like normal human behavior, I think it brings out the worst in people in society. I think that like, for example, uh, to use an example, people need to obey traffic laws and we need to be on the same page about, about um, just basic things that work in society. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to hear what you wanted to say about anarchism, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not pro anarchist, anyone listening. <laughs> um, so when it comes to like our politics right now and the level of division that we have, uh, you know, it's everything is pretty much uh, construed as red, blue, left, right. What do you think is the cause of all of the division that we have currently? That's a really great, great question, Julian. Um, so I think the the most pressing way that that happened in our society in terms of being divisive and feeling divided and feeling separated from our neighbors is that the social media algorithms uh, picked up on how outrage uh, culture and the, the feeling of outrage in the human nervous system, uh, that's marketable, that's capitalistic. Uh, so social media has been a huge factor in that, I think. Hmm. And like, do you think that, because I feel like even before social media, it was, it was uh, still like, we were super divisive. So do you think that it's that social media essentially uh, exacerbated those, that tension that was already there and kind of just put us over the edge? 
I, I do think it was already there and social media did put it over the edge. And probably if we had to look back and in retrospect and think about what started the division, um, I think it's really sad and simple to say, but a lot of people don't know their neighbors anymore and don't take the time to get to know their neighbors and create neighborhoods and. Yeah, no, yeah, I think that's a, a good point that you that you that you uh, pointed out, because I think, for instance, uh, like Brett Reinstein makes a good point. Uh, him and um, Jordan Peterson, I remember they had a, a conversation way, way back where he was saying that when you look at human society right now and how, especially in Western culture, how quickly we've uh, been able to populate at such large uh, totals and like in what, in the large proximity in which we live, but, and, and then even though like we, we live all bunched up and everything, no one really truly knows the person that they live next to. Uh, there's so many people in the world. It creates this perception that, you have to be better than a certain individual versus when people lived in small towns, the only thing that you had to compare to was like two or three people in your area. And it was more uh, of a collective unit and there was less individualism. And it created this mechanism where like at that time, there was less depression, all these other things, because you weren't as worried about everyone else because you weren't as you know tuned in via the internet with what everyone else is doing. Yeah, we don't even fully know the extent of how social media shapes our brain. I mean, social media is like playing dopamine lottery. We have never never before we had to contextualize that in human society. Yeah, and it's definitely having an impact on on the youth. Like there's been studies that show that it uh, can amplify depression and everything, especially when your brains haven't been formulated prop, like, you know, completely yet. So like all of the, the, the exposure of all of these things, especially for girls, they say it, it creates low self-esteem and all these other things because you, there, there's something about social media. It's interesting where when you see that someone's doing something, it, it kind of makes you question what you're doing and it makes you feel bad if they're having a good time and you're not having a good time. It's, it's very, it's very fascinating. So it seems like you're, you're not really big on, on the, the tech industry, on social media. Like I'm a skeptic. I question the motives. Um, I, I personally don't appreciate uh, being used as a science experiment, but I opt into it because it's so, it's fun. It's easy. It's a great way. <laughs> it's a great way to socialize. Um, but uh, I'll never forget. I read one time um, in a book that I, I can't remember the title. But even um, tech executives do not let their children play with iPads and technology because it is so addictive. All right. It's ba they're basically drug dealers in a sense. Yeah, I agree. And like, I guess to that extent, since we're talking about drugs now, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the, the pharmaceutical industry? I'm a major skeptic of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I believe that uh, they create customers. They need customers. They need, they need the supply and demand, just like every other industry. I question the motives of doctors who just put people on medication instead of getting to know them on an individual level and talking holistically about their health and well being. Um, and I believe in the phrase a patient cured is a customer lost. Yeah, unfortunately, it's true. You know, one thing that I always say, like, I, I just find it really um, disheartening, I guess, for lack of a better word, that, you know, things that we know can be mitigated by just changing your diet, we omit that information and try and just shove a pill down someone's throat, regardless of what it may be. And, you know, I, like, I know firsthand within the pharmaceutical industry, I remember when I used to work in restaurants, there would be these, like we had like a private dining room uh, 
downstairs and every week like around the clock there would be at least three or four times where there would be a pharma salesperson who basically would be whining and dining a bunch of doctors trying to get them to buy their drugs wow and and that's that 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 was normal then i think that they there's been like things uh put into place where that's kind of mitigated and you're not allowed to do that because that's considered technically bribing or whatever but it's just really mind-boggling that there are so many things that happen that we know firsthand in regards to you know the opioid crisis and all these other things of bad players and they you're just able to like throw some money at it and everyone kind of just goes about their their business and it's no one's the wiser yeah follow the money yeah so one thing that's interesting because like i i do think that you know when like you you see conversations with uh people who prob- would probably identify more as progressive there there's this tendency with libertarianism to like look at it as if it's uh like a right wing ideology why do you think that is that's a great question i think first and foremost because libertarianism is fiscal uh conservatism um in other words libertarians advocate for no taxes typically like little to no taxes um abolishing the income tax like abolishing the federal reserve um so uh by nature that is fiscal conservative conservatism conservatism um, <laughs> conservative um so yeah progressives uh counter argue that by saying but who who will fund social programs don't you want to live in a society where your taxes are being used for the greater good how will you live in society without an income tax and like who i guess what, right and like what would be i guess your counter argument to that yeah for sure so um i'm a little ignorant um about this because there's so much that i don't know that i should know um so so i think of it this way uh that is the best the best most practical way um that i can describe it when you work for a living you're entitled to a hundred percent of the income that you make so if you don't want to opt in to um to taxes and social programs that's your that's your right as a sovereign being and that relates to natural rights i see and so but like are are you saying no taxes at all or you want to like lower the amount of taxes that they should be lowered they should be lowered most people in america who work full-time are paying almost one third almost 33 percent of all their income towards taxes right i i feel like that's something that and and this is the thing because like i think that a lot of people generally just kind of are at birth or like like sometime during their adolescence like you know basically brainwashed and said you're this or you're that you're a democrat you're a republican and don't necessarily go into the details of what that even entails like what the the actual um agenda is and all those other things and then you basically have these people who aren't really looking deep into like the details of things but they're just like completely all in on a particular group just because they were told to yeah that can be a problem too because some people realize that they're not satisfied in life unless they're intentional or conscientious about their political and personal beliefs right and so i guess like focusing on like other aspects of of libertarianism like what are some other like what are some things that you think people don't know about it that like would be appealing because like i feel like for instance what you're saying like in regards to the fact that we pay so much like we 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 put so much of our own money into taxes and all these things. And you're saying we should lower that. I feel like that's something that would probably be appealing to most people. Like what are some other things that probably people don't even realize, but that are applicable within libertarianism? 
Yeah, wow. There are so many great things that come to mind about what personal responsibility and individual liberty can mean to people. Um, and that doesn't mean running around being selfish. It means you take care of your personhood. You make good decisions for yourself. You make good decisions for your family. Um, so what people, I think, can really benefit from knowing is how their time and attention would be freed up if they regained um, some of the income that they had spent that got taken out of their paychecks from taxes. Right. And aren't like, would you say that you're, you're anti-war? Very much so. Yeah, I think that's another thing that people are probably aren't familiar with libertarianism. Very big on, you know, getting out of wars, not being all over the place, using taxpaying money to do all of this nonsense. Um, what are your thoughts, though? I'm curious on Social Security. Yes. So ideally, the long story short is that I think Social Security should be phased out. Um, in other words, if you're already grandfathered in and you've already worked, whatever you've you've worked towards like people who are already in their late twenties, early thirties, who've already worked for that, you're grandfathered and you get what you already worked for. Um, because when people look at their, uh, the breakdown of what got taken out of their paycheck, it tells you already too. So for people who are paying attention, um, but yeah. I think- Yeah, social security, that gov or whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, but long story short is that social security should be phased out because the rate of inflation just can't keep up with all of these social programs that we we didn't even voluntarily opt into these programs. Right. We, we want to benefit from social programs in a civilized society, but if uh, a person doesn't have control, if a person doesn't have the control to have opt into what they're paying for, then that's unconstitutional. Right. And I think, you know, the, the other thing about Social Security that um, like when you think about it, I don't know how I feel personally, like I'm kind of torn. Like I, I feel like the thing that's that's a bit annoying to me in regards to just all the, all the mechanisms of savings plans within this country is that it's like, you know, with Social Security, it's like, okay, 64, 65, once you reach that age, you can take it out. But if you wait, you can, uh, I think it like doubles the amount that you get uh, monthly. And I think the thing that that kind of is frustrating is that first and foremost, there are unfortunately, because of the, the structures, of our, structures of our society and, you know, the lack of, you know, inf information on health and everything, there are a lot of people who end up not even getting to the point of living to the point where they can even spend that money. So it's like, you've been putting, you've been investing into this thing, slaving away, working for, you know, 40 plus years. And then there's a the potential that, you know, because of poor choices on, on consumption of food and all these other things, you, you die before you even get to use it. And then it's like, they're, they're dangling that you can get a bit more and they're like just wait like hold on and wait a little longer and it's like dude like by the time you're you're that that age you're probably gonna have so many you know like things that are wrong with your body and everything that like it it, it just seems kind of messed up to like have this 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 idea and this 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 culture in which you're supposed to basically waste all of like your your good the good years of your life like working 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 paying all of this this taxes and all these other things to then get a quote unquote reward towards like potentially the time in your life where you'll be able to, you know, quote unquote, relax. Yeah. It's like kicking the can down the road. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. Um, what do you, so completely different topic. Uh, <laughs> what's your thoughts on just where we are culturally and the sudden obsession and acceptance uh, of cancel culture. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate the topic. Um, and it's important to talk openly about it too. I know I'm not the only one um, who notices it and is worried about it too, because it gets me thinking in a frame of mind where I'm like, what if, you know, things got so bad in this country and it spilled over and affects the next generation. That's not fair to them. Like we can all agree, most people want to be good people and they want to do the right thing. People just differ on, um, people differ politically about how they want to achieve those ends. So starting with that as a baseline, it worries me personally, I'm worried about where this country is going too. When I look around um, and I live in Florida and everyone is so nice and friendly, I feel very removed from the way things were um, in New York, to, to be frank. I think New York um, became a very um, complicated and sometimes hostile uh, political environment. And unfortunately also, I think um, the most visible symptom of um, unrest and cancel culture side effects is that people um, got very upset over uh, the mask wearing or lack thereof. And that was very divisive too. Right. And like, do you think that like, would like, do you think that this is just more so uh, just humans being humans and like, you know, the fact that we're in a pandemic and everything, it's kind of like amplifying everyone's uh, anxiety and th that's like to, to play? Or do you think that there's something deeper behind it? Yes, there, I do think there is something deeper behind it. I think a lot of facets of the pandemic are manufacturing a crisis to divide and conquer people, to separate people, to agitate people and instill um, into a, a fear mode of people where it's hard to think rationally and think in a spiritual minded way and think of being neighborly when you're uh, deathly afraid of a deadly virus. Right, uh, I feel like the news, like <laughs> I don't even, I, I'm not, I've never really been into like watching the news, but it is interesting um, when like you do see the news on all like it's, it's pretty much just doom and gloom. I want to say 80% of it. And then there'll be maybe like a, a fluff piece towards the end. And people just eat that shit up. Like, do you think that there's, there's something like, do you think that human beings deep down kind of like the, the, the negativity, it's like almost like a drug. That's really interesting you say that because evolutionarily we're hardwired to, to see danger where we need to run away. Evolutionarily, there's a lion on the savannah. You need to run away. <laughs> so you mobilize, <laughs> a person mobilizes from their, their fear response. So we know that mainstream media capitalizes on this by getting people hooked on what's the next headline going to be what do i need to look out for am i safe what do i need to do so this whole flight or fight or flight response um gets people inevitably hooked on on the media whether they like it or not yeah it's it's kind of crazy uh I, I wonder what, like, do you, what do you think, why do you think it is that some people are able to, to look away while others just get, you know, encapsulated by it? Wow, that's really deep. Um, I think that people ultimately have the freedom and awareness once a person is aware that they would like to turn off the news that's when you turn off the mainstream news. Mm. But a person has to consciously decide, no, nah, I don't think I'm gonna watch CNN. I think they're fear mongering. Right. And I guess like to that extent, I guess it's would you would you would you say that it's it's safe to say that potentially it's that there are people whose level of consciousness and it, it, it could be because of the things that they they do, activities that they do is elevated to a point where they're able to kind of see through it while others might be 
more encapsulated into the the illusions of of this you know thing we call life yeah i i do tend to believe that um some people just naturally want to seek out a deeper more or more spiritual way of looking at things a more introspective way of viewing the world more curious but other people are um unfortunately more susceptible um to being afraid or i think a huge theme the past year in american life is is that a lot of people didn't want to believe that the government would perpetuate a crisis in the name of a pandemic right and do you, like do you think that it's it's one of those things where there's like when it comes to just the the division the fear mongering and everything do you think that it's one of those things where it's 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 almost a conspiracy where like there's groups of people who are just re like really looking to to turn the wheels of this or do you think that it's more on a subconscious level i think it can be subconscious yeah i think that a lot of things are conscious excuse me a lot of things are subconscious until we make them conscious right yeah because like you know one thing that i think is that you know for instance taking government for instance like i think with government you know a lot of times it's easy to like look at at you know how inefficient it is and how all over the place the parties are and everything and think that it's something that's insidiously done and that like they're they're intentionally doing these things but then i was listening to this conversation um on lex fridman's podcast shout out lex fridman love that guy uh where he was having a conversation with this uh this guy who used to be uh, a press person for the white house and this guy like they were talking about like government and the the interesting way in which how uh, one of the similarities between Obama and Trump was that when people saw those two, they, they saw them as uh, a change in the establishment and a, 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 they, there was the hope that they would uh, really, really uh, make things better and, and different from how it was. But in both cases, you see that the bureaucracy within the government ensured that regardless of whatever it is that their vision was, things maintained how it always is. And the thing that the guy said that I found really interesting was that one of the reasons for that is because when you're president or when you're, when you're like, whenever you have any role within government where like you get to appoint people, the, the most important thing that you do when you're there is make sure to appoint people who actually will enforce the, the vision that you have. And a lot of the times in all administrations, the president will have a vision, but the bureaucracy within those departments are so strong that it doesn't matter what you want to do. They're a well-oiled machine and they're going to keep doing what they do. Like, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of talk, like more, more than ever, I feel like people are aware of uh, the concept of the deep state. And it's like, you're saying, things don't change because people who have the ultimate power and influence don't want things to change. And it doesn't matter if it's Obama in office or Trump in office or now Biden in office, like the deep state still exists. And until we we all see past that, which fortunately a lot of people see, see right through it, um, because it's never about um, us versus each other. It's about us versus the giant deep state system. Right. And it seems like we're we're trapped in this 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 never ending vicious cycle where it seems like people are more uh passionate about right now at least are more passionate about voting against something rather than for. Like what are yeah. your thoughts on that? I see that too. Um that's why I try to be very mindful of the phrase promote what you love rather than bash what you hate. Like, I love a good joking meme about anything. I think anything uh, to a certain extent uh, can be funny and that everyone should see the humor in life. But I'd rather 
um, talk about, post about how much I admire Ron Paul and his libertarian philosophy, rather than, you know, scream from the rooftops that I'm not a huge Biden fan. Um, yeah, I, I, I like, you know, I, I, I don't know if a Biden fan is listening right now, but I, I really don't think anybody's a Biden fan, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why do you think that is? Uh, well, first off, he, like, I, I think that he was an ends, he was an ends to a mean or means to end, however you say that. And I think that a lot of people kind of just held their nose while voting for him. Cause like I said before, I think it was more that people were voting against something rather than for, uh, I think that just in general, when you look across the board, there aren't many people willing to run for president that people would be passionate for, that people would be voting for rather than voting against something. I think that the people that that we have currently, um, for the most part, don't have like a really uh, innovative and true vision for the future. It's more so just the same old same, donor, like please the donors, give us a bunch of fluff of what you supposedly want to do. But then when you actually come into the office, nothing actually changes. Yeah, it's been overall uh, to to that point. It's been very disappointing watching. I mean, Biden. It's it's sad. It's like elder abuse. He can't even hold a coherent <laughs> press conference. I feel yeah. bad for everyone who voted for him just because they hated Trump. It's a sad situation. It's a st sad state of affairs. So, uh, would you have wanted? the libertarian candidate to win or yes, I voted for Joe Jorgensen right and the, the the one thing that so what are your thoughts on the the other third party the green party yeah well that's interesting too because I think uh the cause for environmental activism is rooted in a lot of good intentions unfortunately the road to hell is paved with good intentions so where um a lot of mainstream like middle of the road um, middle of America type of people, they're afraid of change and, and let's face it, change can be very scary, but the, the, um, the ideology behind environmentalism and environmental activism is very scary for a lot of people because they see its, um, its focus on collectivism and doing things for the greater good. They see that and they think socialism automatically. So, so like, uh, just just to to clarify, do you think that it's that that it like their their agenda is is good, but it's just the the way that they package it, or are you against it? Yeah, I I consider myself relatively neutral about it. That's fair. It. That's fair. Yeah, I I hear you. Um, I and and if you don't want to like touch too much on this subject because you're not too familiar, that's fine. But I wanted to kind of harp on postmodernism and the 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 impact that it potentially is having uh societally like what are your thoughts on that yeah for sure so i think there's actually something there's a dangerous quality to disavowing the past entirely um and in thinking that the, the past doesn't matter because it's really easy especially for young vulnerable minds to uh, devolve into thinking that nothing matters then. So I think postmodernism um, reeks of nihilism, um, unfortunately, right? Because we ideally we wanna take the best things about modernity and modern technology, but it's also scary. Like as I'm, I'm getting closer to 30, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm an adult now and i have all of my past and past experiences behind me and what was the point of of a person going through things in life so you learn so i guess you could say i'm also uh very skeptical about um based on what i've heard uh, maybe i'm missing something so i hope you can fill me in about uh modernism no no yeah I, I i'd go a bit further and say that uh i'm i'm very like i'm very scared about it i think that so like when i like and postmodernism is like it's 
it's super complex. Like I, I only understand it at a very, very uh, basic level, but essentially to your point, like you were saying, it's to an extent, I wouldn't say completely disavowing the the past, but definitely uh, it's, it's an era in which we, we used to have a time frame in, in, in our history where it was, there was the consensus was that, you know, for instance, art was objective. That there were certain things that are clear and cut within our society, and now with postmodernism, it kind of questions a lot of things and makes it, it brings up this this idea or this ideology that there are things that are, that, that certain things aren't written in stone and that certain things should be uh, questioned and altered. And I think to an extent, I think that 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 culturally that that's valid, but I think that it kind of creeps into the realm of things that I think are very dangerous societally in regards to um, just some of the conversations that you see around um, just gender and sexuality and uh, like the, the structure of family households and things where I think it's perfectly valid and fine to have a conversation, but I do see that it seems like Without postmodernism, the acad like the the upper class academics really are like just sinking their their claws into this and really gaining traction in regards to just the level of influence and exposure that it's getting. And I feel like it's growing so quickly to the point where it's becoming a bit uncontrollable. Like when you look at social media and some of the, the the ideas, like things that I think we've all been pretty much on the same page about, and I think now it's creating a level of cynicism. Uh, I think that it's it's bad for nationalism because it creates an environment where we, uh, instead of just because like I think it's perfect. Like I said, it's perfectly fine. I think to question some of the things that have happened, like the history of the country and things like that. But it's getting to the point where it's it's going above just questioning and and now it's vilifying and doing all these things. And I, I wonder, and I want to get your your POV on this. Like, is it do you think that similar to the other conversation that we had, is this more on a subconscious level, or do you think that there's something more to it? Yes. And I think a lot of things are snowballing too. And, and things have changed in society faster than a lot of people can keep up. We don't even know how some of these concepts are changing us and influencing us subconsciously. Right. Um, and um, so your question is uh, with all the changes that are going on in society, do, do people, um, do people kind of move towards these different movements and subsections consciously or well no not even like the the people who are moving but like the just the the people who are uh who are um influencing and and like you know spreading this like do you think that it's something where like they're doing it intentionally or like it's more on the oh subject? yeah very intentionally very intentionally and i think what i think is um there's this, this underlying um, psychological need for people who, who genuinely believe that they're on the right side of history. That's great for them, but they want to force everyone to do things their way all the time. It impedes on other people's natural rights. Right. And on that point, I do, so like, I, I don't know, are you, have you ever read or listened to Jordan Peterson? Yes, I'm a fan. Yeah, big fan. Uh, I haven't read the second book, but uh, I read the first one. One thing that he, he talks about and that like he even um, wrote in his book that uh, I'd love to get your POV on is he, I love when he he highlights, like, so like one one thing, he's really big on archetypes, which like that that definitely hits home with me. I love mythology. I love uh, Judaism. I find a lot of the archetypes, a lot of the stories in there uh, very impactful. And I think it really, it resonates. And it also, to me at least, is indicative 
as to why it is that the, the, the Jewish people have done so well, even in spite of all of the uh, persecution, all the things that have occurred, because they had these archetypes, they had these stories, they had these traditions, this culture that was that was so strong, so robust, and and was so imperative to everyone to maintain and to cultivate that it transcended all of the the things that they had to go through throughout time and ensure that there was always that stable mechanism. I'm kind of going off of a tangent of what I was going to say, but <laughs> there's that. Um, but I, I really like when he talks about uh, communism and uh, socialism and how when you when you look at when it was when it kind of initially gained traction, he, he says that it, it was primarily pushed forth by the intellectuals and that the intellectuals who are who are pushing uh, the, the notion of it and everything, it was less about that they care about the poor and more that they hate the rich. Do you think that we're in a similar situation where there are a lot of people in the academics and everything who are perpetuating all of these socialistic type of ideologies and it's less in regards to their actual concern for the people who who are like, you know, who are the subjects that they're talking about and more for their, you know, disdain for the rich? Yeah, these are all great points. I like this tangent. Um, <laughs> Yes. So the intellectual class has a lot of parallels between um, the communist takeovers of the 20th century and now. Um, and it's unfortunately people who are intellectual, who have social capital and resources, they're more removed from the actual day-to-day -day effects of what communism, what that looks like for people and the powerlessness that that brings to people, they're more removed because they have social capital and, and resources. So it's entirely counterproductive. Right. And, you know, like it's, it's, it's really interesting because it's like the, the people that are like pushing and perpetuating these things are almost always people who are coming from privilege and who don't, truly like you know have hands-on experience in regards to you know what like it, it entails and I find it very what are your thoughts on the fact that it, it seems as if we've forgotten about the gulags and you know just Mao and all the people that died and and the things that come with the the ideologies in which they're perpetuating yeah, well, it really makes a person think, um, why is communism the worst idea that just refuses to die, right? Because we know that good ideas don't require force. So people don't need uh, to be convinced or forced to give up all their personal incomes and liberties in favor of collectivism, people don't need to be forced to do what is inherently right and meaningful and natural to a human. Um, so yeah, huh. like yeah. why, why, why is communism um, and people can masquerade it as, but socialism works because this, that, the other thing and Nordic countries are doing so well. Um, Okay, but in America, we have over 330 million people in this country. You can't tell me that it's functional to expect such a heterogeneous gene. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of um, different cultures living together, which is great because that's what makes America such a beautiful um, dynamic country. You can't tell me 330 million people want to be governed under communism it just doesn't work in practicality right and i guess you know before we we scurry off to another topic um what do you think like do you think because like you know i think from what you were saying before and what we've been saying uh i think it's pretty sure it's pretty obvious that we're we're not a uh, pro-communism or socialism but would you would you make would you agree that there is crony capitalism right now and that there there are things that need to be addressed with 
uh, the ideology of our economy right now? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, crony capitalism, um, it's, it's the worst for the environment and, and for people's like to human flourishing. Like monopolies don't encourage um, free markets. And yeah, I, I, I really do hear uh, people who lean uh, more liberal politically. I totally understand uh, why they have a bone to pick um, with the ultra, ultra rich um, people. And like, to that point, though, because one thing that I find interesting is that it, it seems a bit, I don't know, I don't want to say hypocritical, but strange that like, as you're saying, you know, there are people who will lean a bit more on like the liberal progressive end because of uh, the the way in which our capitalistic society is structured and the the monopolies and all these other things. But I feel like it's one of those things where, you know, I guess perception is reality. And we've all like kind of grasped onto this notion that, you know, the blue party is the party of of you know the common person and that like they they have their best interests at heart but when you look at both parties they're they're both in bed with with corporations just different ones yeah so yeah, like I, I appreciate I, that you you see right through that as well so like what i guess what would be like what's the the perspective of of libertarianism in regards to like capitalism and a fair and free market and things like that. Yeah, so libertarianism uh, rests on the, the premise of free markets. In other words, you let the best products and the best goods and services, you let those win. The bad ideas just get pruned away. Um, if, you, if you can't uh, market and deliver a product and service that people need and want, people aren't gonna buy it. So the market speaks for itself. Okay, I'm gonna push back a little because sure. okay, the, the market will will like you're saying that the market will take care of it, like supply and demand. But what about like so so what are your thoughts then in regards to uh some sort of mechanism to like kind of intervene if there's like foul play, uh you know, malfeasance, uh impact. To the environment and things like that like do you think that the government should intervene at at any point yes when absolutely necessary that's just my that's my personal opinion and that's where i probably deviate from more uh mainstream or staunch libertarians right yeah because i like i i agree to an extent with with you know just like the market dictates and everything but i do think that it, it's one of those things where you need government in some capacity but it's just i think a conversation in regards to what to what extent and right yeah minimal government right and what, what are your thoughts on on um on the right to bear arms i'm pro second amendment and like so to at all extents or do you think that there should be some sort of limitations yes i'm in favor of background checks, um, psychological checks, um, all the safety measures in place too. I don't, um, I don't think that people naturally want to be violent. Um, I think that people uh, just need to defend themselves in modern society. No, yeah. I, I think that most people would think that that's reasonable. I think that's another thing where people probably would just presume that a libertarian would be similar to a Republican where you just want everyone to have a gun and no checks whatsoever. I think that that's pretty reasonable. I feel like most people would agree on that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on health care? Oh, it's so complicated, but it's so <laughs> it's well, in an ideal world, right? In an ideal world, um, everyone can have the same quality and access to care. Um, but the reason why um, healthcare 
um, healthcare is a positive right in that someone else has to provide a service for you. So in theory, it's unethical to, to make uh, doctors and nurses work in hospitals. It's unethical to dictate uh, what people specialize in, in med school, for example. Um, but I'm definitely willing to hear uh, the other sides of the argument about adequate health care. Uh, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> as, as a, yeah, I don't really have much to, like you said, it's a complicated topic. Uh, there, there's other things I'd be interested in <laughs> debating with you and talking about. Um, let's talk about money. So walk me through, like I'm familiar, but I, I want you to walk, walk us through uh, money, how we've gotten to the point of fiat money, what that, what that impact, what impact it had on us and the world and what you think we should be doing. Great question. Um, our currency, the US dollar is not backed by the gold standard anymore. Um, so what we have is hyperinflation. In other words, gold uh, represents that money is supposed to mean something. Money is a means of exchange. However, if, the, if and when the federal government just has money printed uh, every time there's a crisis and we need to get bailed out, every time there's a stimulus package or a new, a new social program, we have a hyperinflated currency. That's why the same dollar that doesn't even buy a loaf of bread today is if you listen to um, elderly people reminisce about when they could buy so many things for only a quarter. That's because of inflation. So every time there's a new um, government spending package, people need to be skeptical. Where are we getting that money from? Because printing it is just completely, it's, it's screwing over future generations because the rate of inflation is just, is just ballooning. Yeah, it's, it's insane. I actually, uh, have you watched the show The Crown? No, I've heard about this though. Are you a fan? Oh yeah, yeah, it's good. It's one of those things where I kind of watch it in tiny increments because like it's I don't know, it's it's not in my opinion at least. There are probably some people listening who are like, fuck you, I binge it, but is that something I can really binge? I kind of just watch it bit by bit. But there was one episode that I found really, really interesting where and it's like most of it's historically factual. Like they, you know, of course, like any show kind of embellish a little here and there, but uh, there was one particular episode that was really, really fascinating where they were talking about how um, in Great Britain, there was a time where the prime minister uh, was in a dilemma based off of the other administration where basically they, they were, I think, in the hole of like 170 million pounds, which today, like you just laugh at that. Like, <laughs> I wish that we were the whole- I thought that we're in the trillions. Yeah. So- <laughs> Basically, um, they they were like, the, the media was all over them. They were trying to figure out ways to divert attention away. So they, one of the, the guys who was kind of like, I guess the equivalent of like the, the um, Secretary of Defense for them, they, they got rid of him because he was trying to spend more money. He's of the royal family, all these other things. So they're like, it's a bad look. Let's get rid of him. He, of course, didn't take it, take it lightly. And it got to the point where um, they were so bad financially that they basically had to uh, lower the value of the pound and people were freaking out and they were explaining how basically the money that you have right now, uh, it's going to stay the same here, but people in other countries will basically be able to get things drastically cheaper, like the exchange rate is going to be beneficial for them. And there was almost a coup. Basically, in the episode, they talk about how they came this close to people trying to group up people in the military. And the only reason why it didn't happen was because the queen would not allow it to. Otherwise, there was going to be a coup. It got bad. And I watched that and I'm like, my God, like, who knows? You know, if, if things if like we don't get this, at, get our affairs in order, who knows what could happen? Um, and you know, when it comes to money printing, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but last year during the pandemic, is it true that 20% of all money that's circulating right now was printed last year? Is that accurate? I'm also aware of that fact as well. Yes, I took that for an accurate fact as that, well. And conservatives are more likely, conservatives and libertarians are more likely to point that out. And unfortunately, on the political left, even the most well-meaning people overlook it. But this is, that's a dangerous game to play. You're right, that's 20%. And, you know, one thing I will say uh, to, to kind of push back towards that a little bit, and it's mostly just playing devil's advocate because I don't really have a team. Uh, when it comes to, you know, like being fiscally conservative, one thing that I find really fascinating is that it seems as if conservatives always talk a big game about being fiscally conservative, but when they're in office, they raise the debt significantly and then when they're out of office, they give the other party hell for doing the exact same thing that they're doing. Not a good look. <laughs> like, <laughs> would you agree? <laughs> I agree. So what, what can we do? And well, before we even get to what can we do, I think the other thing I wanted to call out is, okay, so inflation, what I think it's like uh, an increase of around 3% every 20 years or so i thought it was more, but that's okay we could use three percent for yeah. argument's sake okay yeah three percent um the one thing that i find interesting when you look at inflation rate and when you look at wages uh a lot of the weight the wages for jobs like uh engineers for instance it's like an engineer you you look at how much you would get paid and let's say because we're in like 2020 like 1980. It's basically consistently throughout those 20 years or so, close to doubled roughly, like when you look at the, the wage. But, and like you see that for other professions too, like doctors, it's, it's significantly risen throughout the years in, in alignment with inflation. But then there are a lot of jobs that I guess you could constitute as low skilled jobs where you don't, it's barely, it's basically flat. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that's okay? No, fundamentally, no, it's unfortunate too because it hurts real people and influences their purchasing power too. People's, people have less purchasing power if their wages aren't keeping up with the rate of inflation. And like, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but like, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you, are you against raising the minimum wage or are you for it? I am. I think that employers and employees need to have conversations and awareness about uh, what their time is worth. Hmm. And but so because I, I think my only counter argument to that would be what if because like, you know, if within the, the mechanism of our society and depending on where you are, it like what if the, the employer has all of the, the power, like you could have that conversation. But what if they're able to just like, you know, find someone who's desperate, maybe like, you know, someone who recently immigrated here and is is willing to to take less because they their 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 prospects are are low. Like, is that fair? That's exploitative and that's fundamentally wrong. Um however, I don't think the government should be intervening um, on the wage debate. I think that like wrong is wrong. And as business owners, they should, that's, it has to be, it has to be on them how they work out their wages and their labor, labor and, and unskilled labor, especially. Hmm. Yeah, but then like, but what if, cause like, if they don't, then are, are you, I guess saying that like, it should just be dictated by the free market and like, you could just go elsewhere. Like that's the, the theory, I guess. That's the theory. Yeah, I, I I hear you, but I feel like with that one, I, I'd push back again because I just feel like, you know, while in in theory that that sounds simple and good, I think that, you know, def depending on, and especially if you're, you're a low-skilled worker uh, and depending on where you live, like the, the prospects of another job may or may not be 
as feasible. And it like, you know, if, if, if you're relying on this for all of your, you know, your food, your shelter and everything, it kind of puts you in a predicament where you have like basically no uh, means for pushing back if they're like, no, because if they say no and, and you just like go, what are you going to do? And that's definitely concerning too. You bring up a great point. Yeah. And I, and I, I really appreciate, and you know, like at the end of the day, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of playing more adversary, but also at the same time, like these are things that I think as well. And I think that it's, I, I, and you know, this could be another topic, but like, it's, it's kind of sad that we've gotten to a point where you can't have a conversation with somebody disagree and be fine with that. And, and, you know, basically just spew back and forth your thoughts <laughs> and, and grow from it. Yeah, I think people should disagree more often. Why would we want to live in a society where we agree about every single thing? That's like robotic. That's not, that's yeah. not conducive to human flourishing. But like, don't you see that it, 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 that is a thing where people yeah. want to be around other people who 100% just are all in on whatever it is that you believe. In other words, it's really, it's a really interesting trend too. People are moving back into a tribal, like a, a tribal mentality, a way of being. And this is ironic because there's a trend more than ever of people moving to cities, living in cities where you're exposed to millions of people like New York and even Orlando. But there's something fundamental uh, about needing to be with a tribe of needing to be understood and seen by like-minded individuals. It's really interesting trend. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, I, I think that it's, it's, there's a multitude of reasons, but I think that the relationship that we have with our devices, I think kind of circling back to what we were saying in regards to social media, I think that that has an impact. Because, you know, the, the device is inherently trying to keep you on there for as long as possible. So it's not going to show you things that you don't like. It's going to learn what you like and keep showing you and confirm the biases that you have. Facebook, same thing. I haven't been on Facebook in years, but, you know, I, 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 I know that like that's, that's what they do because that's how they're able to maintain the stream of revenue that they garner. That's how the advertisers make their big money. Yeah, it's it's sad. And I think that, you know, when you, you hear and when you think about, you know, like, for instance, Cambridge Analytica and how, you know, they essentially were able to put forth, you know, all these political political strategies uh, via, you know, natural at, like uh, posts that people didn't even realize were, were ads like. I remember I saw this thing where they were saying how I think it was like in uh, Haiti or something where they they made this um, this uh, this whole strategy where basically the the population was split in two like one half was like more African and the other half was Indian and the Indian politician paid them and what they did was basically they created a campaign where they they made all of these these native um, ads. Like, so it, it wasn't an ad, it was more of a post, but it's basically an ad where they, they made it where they, they made it seem as if it was cool not to vote. And like, they, they like came up with a slogan and everything. And they were like, screw voting, blah, 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 that they, that they basically targeted the African group with to basically lower their presence in the next election. And it worked ridiculously. The, the amount of youth that voted was like at an all time low and the the Indian candidate won because of that. It's insane. I don't think that we fully understand the the magnitude of of technology and of the internet and of social media and the influence it could have on us. And that's a scary thought is the uncertainty involved in it too and how and how if we've learned anything in the past couple of years in 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 life like how easy it is for um, these big just tech giants or and in the case to backtrack about what we were talking about before big pharma they're out to manipulate you they don't see you as a sovereign being 
worthy or capable of making your own decisions. They want to own you. They want to own your data. They want to advertise to you. They want you to be a lifetime customer. It is right. truly terrifying. Yeah. But, you know, I want us to end on a positive note, though. Uh, <laughs> I think that while there definitely is a lot to be, um, I don't want to say scared of, but like aware of and, you know, just privy of what's going on. I think at the same time, I think that there are things uh, positive going on. And I, I wanted to get your POV on some things that, that you see that, that are shining a glimmer of hope on the future and that gives you hope. Yeah, this is wonderful to think about. I think that uh, more so than ever, people who are politically and socially active um, have a sense of hope and positivity about where things can go and how things can improve. And the young, um, energetic people, um, especially the youth, I think there's so much opportunity to look at what happened in this country over the past year. Um, and say, we don't have to be like that. We can stick together. We can love our communities and do nice things for our neighbors. And we can care about the elderly and vulnerable and still make decisions, uh, personal decisions that are meaningful for ourself and our personhood. I think there's a lot of opportunity for change and transformation. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And um, what would you say, and I'll, I'll edit this because <laughs> I, I meant to ask something else before that, but, um, I'll just switch it around. What would you say is your biggest fear for the future? My biggest fear is that people will get so stuck in their silos of knowledge that they'll stop caring they'll become more apathetic. They won't want to collaborate with people who might disagree with them about a couple things, but they'll miss an opportunity to collaborate with people who would otherwise make perfectly good allies. Right, basically biting their nose despite their face. Exactly. Right, and is there is there any particular um, person who is like, maybe like, Get, dipping their feet into politics or who you know maybe isn't even involved at all but you think should be that you think uh is someone who potentially can give the country hope and like unite people and um does it have to be someone who's not already explicitly political uh how about you give me how about you give me one of, of each how about that Oh, great question. Well, okay, so the person who isn't um, necessarily uh, political is the artist Alanis Morissette. She's <laughs> I admire her. I admire her. Um, I've always been a huge fan of hers. I think she's extremely smart and sensitive, and there's a lot of opportunity for her to um, influence people. I think um, her brand, um, they tend to lean... Uh, uh, more left politically, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to be connective and kind and set a good example. And then someone who's explicitly um, political, um, it's a very divisive figure, but I think if more people just set aside their angry preconceived notions sometimes, Ben Shapiro, he's a great role model. <laughs> he really cares about his family. He really cares about his family and he's very fair and he does always make a point to see more than one side of an issue and he stands up for truth and justice and I think if more people just listened to a full episode of him they'd understand that he's not just some raging republican who's out to get who's out to destroy all the liberals. I I enjoy Ben Shapiro and I, I, I don't think Ben Shapiro would. would be. <laughs> Too much of a hot button figure, you think? I think so. I think so. <laughs> I, I'm curious. What, what are your thoughts on Marianne Williamson? I love her. Her books are wonderful. I like that she combines. Um, we, we have our differences. But fundamentally, I think she's pointing to a very um, wholesome and lasting truth about the human condition. 
Um, every human is worthy and capable of healing and capable of giving and receiving love. I, I really appreciate her spiritual perspective. No, yeah, same, actually. It, like, I, it's funny, like, when she ran for president, I, like, was like, oh, my God. But then when she, you know, and, you know, the Democratic Party, like, in the primary, like, she got maybe two seconds to talk. But, like, the two seconds that she did talk, I was like, wow. I'm like, wow. she's making a lot of sense. I was like, holy shit. Okay, Marianne. You know, it's so funny, Julian. I think she makes sense to people who, who are receptive to what she's saying. Yeah, like, you know what it is? I, I think that, unfortunately, we live in a society where if you start talking about spirituality and energy and things like that, people, because of the, the way in which our society is structured, people, like, get turned off by that and they think that it's woo woo when at the end of the day like that's probably the only thing that's actually real whoa <laughs> i tend to very strongly agree with that too but anywho erica thank you so much this has been an absolute pleasure uh i'd hope to have you again sometime if we could definitely let's do this again thanks so much for having me on the show absolutely